There is so much we do not know right now, but you say there are kind of three buckets of how we should be looking at this. That's right, Brian. Yes. Yeah. So we're tracking sort of three things. The first one is transmissibility. Um, obviously, if this outcompetes Delta and overtakes Delta as the dominant variant, then you have to worry about it. But if it doesn't end up outcompeting Delta, then it's going to go away because Delta will still be the dominant variant. You know, unfortunately, the sort of current evidence that we have suggests that it is outcompeting Delta. If you look at the sequenced cases in South Africa, it appears to have overtaken Delta in a few weeks' time. Um, if you look at some other evidence, there was uh, overnight um, they found some cases in the in the Netherlands earlier than people were expecting. You've seen a significant jump in cases in the Netherlands, which may be correlated. So it does appear, at least the early evidence, that it is outcompeting Delta, but we still need to figure that out. Um, the second bucket yeah. is around vaccine effectiveness, which you which you highlighted. And, and there, you know, unfortunately, it takes a little bit of time to understand what's going on, but we do have some things to look at. Um, the beta variant, it contains some of the same mutations, and that had a reduction in vaccine effectiveness. So I think it's pretty clear that we're going to reduce vaccine effectiveness, but I think it's also important for everybody to realize that that's usually around symptomatic cases. Um, with all the other variants, we haven't seen a reduction in efficacy against hospitalization. Which is, a, which is a key and sort of core component. And then the last thing people ask about is um, disease severity. And unfortunately, that's going to take the longest time to figure out, probably four to six weeks. So we'll know something on transmissibility and vaccine effectiveness in the next two weeks, clearly. But uh, disease severity, we just have to wait a little bit longer to get some idea of hospitalization rates and mortality. Okay, so if I'm hearing you right, in, in sort of your second bucket, if you will, uh, based on the beta version, which has been overtaken because we're just kind of moving around, that similar mutations, not exactly the same. There are more on this one on the spike protein, but similar. But it looks like that even if the vaccines don't work as well, they should maybe work fairly well against severe outcomes. Am I hearing you correct, Matthew? Yeah, that, that that's our current view right now, given what we know. Obviously, as you point out right there are 32 mutations on the spike protein here 15 in the receptor binding domain and so we don't we haven't seen all of the mutations and we definitely haven't seen all the mutations together so you could have a different outcome but given what we've seen previously you may have a significant reduction in your ability to protect against uh, symptomatic disease mm -hmm. but you seem to have very strong protection against hospitalization I was speaking with a PhD virologist two nights ago about this, and, and he said that often, not always, and again, not making any pronouncements, but often when viruses mutate to this level, they will often weaken because they're sort of desperate to find a home. They're trying to find any open door they can. I know we're not asking to put you on the spot. We know we don't know a lot of things, but historically, when viruses mutate and even become more transmissible as possible, they will also weaken. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that is the historical trend. Um, I, I think the only thing that I would caution here is typically you see one or two mutations as you jump variants. You know, here we jumped from uh, seeing one or two to this cumulative set of 50 mutations in, in, in one variant. So there's, there's a lot more unknowns here, which I think is why everybody's trying to be a little bit cautious about what the outcome could look like. Okay, let's talk about treatments. Yesterday, Merck got approval, very narrow approval, but it did get approval on that oral antiviral. You follow a company called Adagio. It's new ADGI is the ticker. You have a buy rating on that company. Talk to us about some of the treatments. Because again, if we all, if we get COVID, we just don't want to get really sick or, or have a more severe outcomes. Talk to us about the treatments and how they differ, Matthew, from the vaccines. There's a lot of confusion out there. They're not the same thing at all, are they? No, no, they're not. But I think it's important to, to highlight that, unlike at the beginning of the pandemic, where we didn't really have a lot of options, we have a lot of options now. Um, and in particular, um, you pointed to the Merck oral. Uh, Pfizer has an oral, which is going to go before the FDA uh, soon. And then there are the antibody treatments. And so all these, all these are for after you've been infected. Obviously, the vaccine tries to protect you against infection so you don't get sick at all. Um, but these are all for treatment, and we have a lot of tools for treatment now. We have the two orals. We have probably three out of the five known antibodies that work against uh, the Omicron strain. 
And so um, they're, they're an important tool that's available for, for treatment. 